So what I'd like to do tonight is talk to you about how you understand the world. What is it that allows you to understand the world, understand each other, and ultimately understand yourself? Because if you think about it, one of the first things that you probably can't even remember but was very important for you was when you first opened your eyes as a newborn infant, you saw what the world was like. At first it was blurry, but gradually you saw what it was that made up the world around you. And perhaps you saw the face of your mother, the face of your father, and that was the beginning of your understanding of the world and your understanding of who you are. Interestingly enough, for science, for biology, being able to see and understand living things has been a critical part of the birth of that science and indeed almost every major breakthrough that we can think of when it comes to understanding how living things work. So that interestingly enough, you can think about, for example, our understanding of the world through art, beautiful paintings by Bierstadt give us a picture of what the world is like, but at the same time that these paintings were done, at the same time there were scientists that were using ink to document what they saw in microscopes. And that in fact, even though it might seem very different from what you're looking at here, there was a similarity in terms of a real attempt to understand the world, but also a real attempt to communicate that understanding to others. So it wasn't just landscapes and rocks and trees, for example. Folks like John James Audubon used art to understand organisms, like this blue jay, for example. And so what you may not realize is that the way in which we understand the world is to a significant degree mediated by how we see it. Right now I'm showing you slides. If instead of Homo sapiens, we were highly intelligent mice, for example, maybe instead of slides, I'd be pumping scented gases into this room. Instead of looking at me, you'd have your eyes closed and you'd be smelling. And from that smell, you would understand the idea that I'm trying to communicate to you. If we were a room full of sentient snakes, maybe what we would have done, we would have handed out cards. And maybe instead of even talking to you, you'd be licking those cards understanding the idea that I'm trying to communicate with you. But so with Audubon, of course, he sought to document sort of the living world around him, and in particular, animals, organisms that he was very excited by and that he wanted to share with the rest of the world. Similarly, Robert Hooke was interested in trying to understand living things that we can't see with the naked eye. And so it was from this simple sort, sort of image from the 1600s that we understand that in fact, all living things are made up of cells. These tiny, remarkable, basic units of life. And so art and the ability to represent things visually was at the very foundation of our understanding of what actually composes life as we know today. So of course, you can look at another more complicated ink drawing, and you can see that the cell is full of all sorts of things. We have broken down cells in all sorts of ways, isolated different components, and tried to, in our mind's eye, put those cells back together. We now have tools that allow us to visualize, by staining different parts of the cell, the actual structures in the cell, and actually how they change over time. So that in some ways, what we have been able to do is use visualization tools to uncover a hidden world, and in some ways, a hidden universe. A universe that is as complex, that is as exciting as the universe that we can see through the Hubble telescope. So that even though they are so different in scale, nevertheless, we can visualize these things and begin to understand them. So it is from that process, though, that we can begin to think of how can we communicate what this world is like. Unlike Audubon, where we cannot, for example, go and simply paint blue jays, these are not animals, these are not organisms, but these are in fact proteins, complex chemical macromolecules that allow life to exist. And how do we communicate what they're like? 
so that we have an opportunity to create visualizations that can show what these sort of processes involve and to basically unveil the universe that lives inside each and every individual cell. A universe that is as exciting and as worthy of exploration as any good galaxy that one can think of. At the same time, this allows us a framework, a framework for understanding how life works, but this also gives us an opportunity to sort of interrogate the methods that we use to communicate this framework. Because what cognitive science tells us today is that for us to understand something, for us to retain that understanding, for us to be able to use it in different ways, we need to arrange it on a scaffold of our own making. There has to be some structure that we can arrange that understanding on. So for a painter like Terry Winters, who's interested in the natural world and in the organization of the natural world, he does paintings that represent scaffolds. But similarly, when we try to communicate science, and frankly, when we try to teach science, which is something I spend a lot of time thinking about, we need to build scaffolds. And indeed, what we need to do is to use the scaffolds that you already have from your visual understanding of the natural world. So that you have another artist like Alexander Ross that uses both structures of macromolecules but also structures in the cell to create what seem like abstractions but abstractions that might seem oddly familiar. At the same time, he can put those things together and create sort of molecular landscapes that once again, even though they're derived from something that we cannot see, nevertheless seem familiar to us. And from this scaffold, we respond to it. It elicits an emotion from us. So that ultimately, if we want to communicate science effectively, what we need to do is to utilize that visual framework that we all develop from the first time that we open our eyes and start to understand the world. So that, for example, the landscapes that we can start to think about are very much based in what happens in our brain, the circuits that are established in our brain that, in fact, is where the scaffold resides, ultimately. And so what we can do is start to understand things that we cannot see and would never be able to see by relating them to things that we are familiar with so that we can think about the dynamic changes in protein structure based on visualizations that not just represent the structure itself, but represent lighted surfaces that we're accustomed to interpreting, that give us a sense of depth, a, a sense of three-dimensional space. At the same time, we can also think about visualizations that really depend on our understanding of the environment and the natural sort of spaces that we are accustomed to. So that one can explore parts of a cell based on, for example, our understanding of topography, of geography. So that in the same way that you can fly across the Grand Canyon and imagine what that is like, and in fact do that, you can also fly through the cell and see the structures that ultimately relate to your understanding of the world around you. Why is this worthwhile? It's worthwhile because this allows you to remember, to retain in your mind what you're seeing, and as a result, to utilize it in the future. But of course, visualization is not just about communicating concepts that you want to retain, it is also about harnessing your passion, making you care. And so art, of course, through the ages, has very much been about harnessing our passions, triggering that lightning storm in your blood vessels, in your veins, that makes you want to do something, that allows you to realize something about the world, and that makes you care about something in the world, be it war, or be the destruction of the environment. And so ultimately, if we think about what we need to do when we communicate ideas, when we teach, what we need to remember is that to see something 
is to begin to understand it. And that ultimately, science is not purely an abstraction. Science is something where we need to reaffirm that pathway from the eye to the mind. And if we have any hope of anyone caring about the world, caring about each other, caring about why science is important, we need to continue that pathway to the heart. So think about that. Thank you.